Down in the depths of Facility 23, a group of scientists stand before a massive, rumbling piece of machinery. They all hold their breath as the gigantic mechanism suddenly stops. It's eerily quiet for a moment before a door slides open. The scientists crane their necks to see inside, to see what the result of their great experiment was. These were some of the greatest minds in the SCP Foundation, but nothing could prepare them for what they had created. September 9, 2008 was an unseasonably frosty day when Dr. Charles Gears, one of the SCP Foundation's most iconic scientists, parked his Honda Civic outside of what seemed like an innocuous government cold storage warehouse. He sipped his coffee and surveyed the building, which he, along with about a hundred others in total, knew to be Site-19, Facility 23. Why was Dr. Gears, former director of all Euclid-level containment at Site-19, here today? Because official testing was about to begin on SCP-914. The Foundation had acquired the machine now known as SCP-914 some time ago, but only after its recent reclassification to 914 had it been relocated to Facility 23. It must have been important because the entirety of the facility was being repurposed for SCP-914 research. They were dealing with an immensely complicated piece of anomalous technology here, and the same question was on everybody's lips. What exactly does this thing do? Dr. Arthur Hackett, the facility director, had requested the cold, clinical assistance of Dr. Gears in providing the answer. Once he'd finished his morning coffee, Dr. Gears headed inside. The facility's security chief, Agent Alan Sedna, had been beefing up security at the building, and at least two mobile task force units were already on call in case anything happened. The first day of official testing is always a crapshoot. You might get a nice drink out of it, like with SCP-294, or you may get an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. You never really know. All Dr. Gears knew, as he walked up the granite steps to the main entrance, was that he was already feeling exhausted. When you've dealt with anomalous objects and entities for decades on end, the sense of wonder and mystery begins to wear off, only to be replaced with a kind of tedium any office worker knows all too well. Everyone knew that Dr. Gears was devoted to the job, perhaps more than anyone else, but he approached the job with an emotionless effect. You wouldn't know from looking at him if he was thinking about the deadly anomalous creature in the next room, or what he was going to have for lunch that day. The doctor passed through security and was briefed in the break room by Dr. Lucius Veritas, director of research at Site-19. He explained that the machine seemed to work in the absence of any power source, its mechanical structure is similar to machinery from the Industrial Revolution, but it's exceedingly complex for something constructed in that time. Foundation analyses into the structure of the 914 machine have shown it to have as many as 8 million moving parts, and that might even be an incomplete estimate. Dr. Gears wore his trademark blank face as he listened, solemnly nodded, and asked to be shown the anomaly. He was led into Containment Chamber 109B by a pair of guards. According to all current Foundation tests, the machine doesn't appear to pose any active risk of containment breach or danger to the guards, earning it the rare safe designation. As a result, aside from guards stationed on site, containment procedures for 914 were minimal. Whether this designation would need to be changed after testing was something Dr. Gears would soon find out. SCP-914 was a truly impressive sight to behold, a giant clockwork mechanism taking up around 18 square feet with an unfathomably complex combination of screwdrives, belts, pulleys, springs, and gears. A less stoic researcher might see the humor in recruiting a Dr. Gears to test such a device, but comedy definitely wasn't one of Dr. Gears' specialties. He stared at the machine with a detached fascination, analyzing its vital components at a glance. Gears noted a large mainspring beneath a rudimentary selection panel. The panel is copper, with a large selection knob fixed to an arrow above a series of different options. Rough, coarse, one-to-one, -one, fine, and very fine. There was also a large key below the selection panel, for the purposes of winding up the mainspring and initiating whatever procedure this machine was designed to enact. Next, Dr. Gears noticed two large booths connected to the machine by a pair of equally large copper tubes. The booth on the left labeled intake, and the right labeled output. Incredibly, Dr. Gears was able to immediately deduce the purpose of this machine. It was designed to enact some kind of transformative process on whatever was placed into the intake booth. 
but what kind of transformative process? That's exactly what Dr. Gears was here to find out. The experiment was simple. They would gather a series of samples, both inanimate objects and living tissue, and use them to explore the different permutations of the 914 machine's transformative abilities. This initial series of experiments were approved by O5 Command and the Site Director, and with the 47 researchers present in Facility 23 at his disposal, Dr. Gears commenced his research into SCP-914. To minimize risk, Dr. Gears decided the first test would be a simple kilogram of steel. On his orders, the steel was placed into the intake booth. With the doctor's approval, a junior researcher set the control panel setting to rough and began twisting the main spring key, at which point the booth's doors closed and a small bell inside chimed. The machine began to rumble, its eight million working pieces churning into life. It continued like this for around 10 minutes before falling silent, at which point the output booth opened. What had once been a single lump of steel weighing one kilogram was now an uneven pile of smaller lumps with evidence of laser cutting. Dr. Gears may note of the fact that having lasers within such a machine is both anachronistic and anomalous, and that the rough setting appears to messily cleave the object placed within the intake booth into pieces. Dr. Gears also noted that it would be unwise to test any kind of explosive material on the rough setting, unless, of course, they wanted to destroy the building. The research continued. Dr. Gears used another one kilogram lump of steel to test the one-to-one -one feature. This time, the result was far more peculiar. The output booth contained the exact same weight in steel screws. This result was sparking even greater connections in Dr. Gears' impressive analytical mind. Firstly, the one-to-one -one feature caused the 914 machine to transform the output into something different from, but similar to, the intake. And while this would require further testing, it appeared that the 914 machine, despite being anomalous, does still follow the laws of physics. Samples passed through the machine conserved their mass and would not be transmuted on an atomic level from one element to another. Next, Dr. Gears pushed another lump of steel through the machine on the fine setting. The result this time was a kilogram of steel carpet tacks. From this, Dr. Gears was able to ascertain that the fine feature improves the samples placed within the intake booth somewhat. However, things got even stranger when Gears performed the same experiment on the very fine setting. The output booth provided several unknown gases and a lump of unknown metal with anomalous qualities. Namely, it was resistant to heat up to 50,000 degrees, impossible to bend or break with any force, and was a perfect conductor of electricity. Dr. Gears suddenly realized his task here may be more interesting than he'd initially imagined. Was that a bit of a smile on his face that one researcher spotted? Surely not. This was the famous unflappable Dr. Gears, after all. The doctor decided to take it up a notch and began to test more complex items in the 914 machine. He removed his own wristwatch and placed it into the input booth before setting the machine to course and letting her rip. Literally, in this case. When the output booth was opened, the watch had been painstakingly disassembled into its component parts, with no damage to said parts. Dr. Gears noted the coarse feature as a more mild version of the rough, in the sense that it was able to take an object apart without any kind of fundamental damage. He also made note of the fact he'd need to get himself a new watch. Dr. Gears then asked one of the researchers to surrender their cell phone for testing. While none were excited at the prospect of their phone getting eviscerated by a clockwork behemoth, one of the researchers eventually surrendered their BlackBerry curve to the doctor. He placed it into the intake booth on the one-to-one -one setting, and 10 minutes later, the output booth released a brand new Apple iPhone. Sadly for the researcher who donated his BlackBerry, he wasn't allowed to keep the new device. Naturally, Dr. Gears was interested in trying out the anomalous, very fine setting on a more complex object. Seeing as no other researchers were eager to hand over their personal effects, he took a Colt Python revolver from a member of security and ran that through the machine on very fine. The result was an extremely powerful energy weapon containing gamma radiation, which fired a beam capable of disintegrating anything in its path. While the weapon's power was immense, it was also too dangerous and unstable to be added to the Foundation's armory for general use. Having collected a wealth of data from more complex objects, Dr. Gears was eager to move to the next stage, live test subjects. While his fellow researchers had some reservations, the experiments pushed on, beginning with mice. 
A single white mouse was put into the intake booth on the one-to-one -one setting, and the machine was activated. The result five minutes later was an almost identical creature, save for the fact that it now had brown fur. Encouraged by the fact that the mouse survived the refinery process, Dr. Gears next applied for the use of two chimps in his SCP-914 experiments. The first chimp was run through the machine on the fine setting. The result was a chimp of human-level intelligence, who has since begun working for the Foundation under the alias Dr. Bobo, and the data from this test has been expunged from the official reports to protect Dr. Bobo's privacy. The second primate test, this time on Ruff, was not quite as positive. The chimp was dismembered, with the mutilated corpse showing evidence of cutting from high heat and crushing. Of course, everyone knew where these tests were eventually going. Dr. Gears requested two members of D-Class personnel for testing. The first was a 42-year-old Caucasian male weighing 108 kilograms and standing 185 centimeters tall. Dr. Gears ran him through SCP-914 on the one-to-one -one setting, resulting in a slightly taller Hispanic man with a slightly lower body weight. He immediately became severely confused and agitated, and attempted to attack the guards present, leading to his unfortunate termination by Foundation staff. It was on the final live test that tragedy truly struck. A 28-year-old Caucasian male was run through the machine on the highly anomalous, very fine setting. The result was an utterly nightmarish creature. So horrifying that the majority of the details on its physical appearance have been expunged from the report. The creature made a sudden escape, breaching the relatively minor containment procedures intended for the inert SCP-914. This highly dangerous creature killed eight guards, as well as two senior researchers upon emerging from the output booth. A special response team was dispatched to take the creature down, but that proved harder than expected. SCP-914 had massively improved upon the human original, especially when it came to its killing ability. Eventually, it was captured, but the special response team suffered injuries and memory loss as a result of the creature's anomalous powers. The creature was also severely wounded, and its blood caused corrosive damage to the plumbing in Facility 23. The creature expired from its injuries several hours later, turning into a cloud of blue ash that blinded a nearby research team. Dr. Gears would later comment that the experiments were ultimately still a success, in spite of some minor hiccups. Testing on the device continues to this day in an effort to understand the full potential of the machine. Though, for obvious reasons, biological testing on the machine has since been forbidden without direct authorization from O5 Command. After all, if an already dangerous SCP was ever subjected to the very fine transformation setting, we could be dealing with something beyond our greatest nightmares. Check out SCP-5000 The Suit and SCP-106 The Old Man for more stories of the strange and dangerous anomalies under the watchful eye of the SCP Foundation.